Hi, this is Amanda. And this is Lindsay. We're True Creeps. Where the stories are true. And the creeps are real. We'll cover stories from grotesque gore. To the possibly plausible paranormal. To horrifying history. To tense and terrible true crime. And everything else that goes bump in the night. We want you to join us while we creep. We cover mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, everybody. As a general note, before we get into today's episode, we wanted to touch base on last week's episode on the Georgia Guidestones. We did a bit more research after the show and realized there was a fundamental gap in our understanding of eugenics. And our discussion showed that. So obviously, we both believe that eugenics is morally reprehensible. I just don't know if we did the best job at explaining how sneaky eugenic ideology and rhetoric can be. It can be as simple as being like, well, we want to keep our population down because it's better for the planet, which we all know. (laughs) But how would we do that? Population control. And I'm like, oh, population control. Okay. But population control is basically just a nice name for eugenics, right? Because whenever the government is going to control population, it's inherently eugenics because there has to be some way of controlling the population. And honestly, taking that question one step further and asking, okay, well, how would that happen didn't occur to me. No. And we also mentioned at one point, like having less kids would be good for the planet. But again, we meant that as a personal choice, not necessarily the government making the choice for them. And we just thought it was important to review this. And we're going to continue with today's episode. So today we're going to talk about something that I am deeply afraid of. Scary shit in bodies of water. (laughs) (laughs) And you've made that very well known. Yeah, I've, I've mentioned it a time or two in our previous episodes that the mystery of what is in the water that we don't know about haunts me regularly. (laughs) So today we're going to talk about some likely fictional things that aren't real. We're going to talk about some prehistoric sea creatures as well as blue holes, which I hadn't heard of before. Neither have I. Mm -mm. Yeah, I was like, perhaps I should as a creature on this planet, but I didn't know what they were. Now I wish I didn't know what they were again. Then we're going to talk about scary things that actually are living today. (laughs) That are terrifying, truly terrifying, and 10 out of 10 don't like, where when we get into it, we're going to start with some mystery creatures. But before we do that, we've mentioned it before, we're going to mention it again. We love when you rate and review us, and we really, really, really appreciate it. If you review us on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, or on Facebook, if you take a screenshot of that, then email us with your address, then we'll send you a sticker. Yeah, and thank you to those that have already done it. Your stickers are on the way. And if you are about to do it, our email address is truecreepspod at gmail.com, and we'll get that sticker sent out. We've also been teasing some very, very exciting news, and we're going to start a Patreon. So we have a few different tiers. If you stick around till the end of the episode, we'll talk about what each one is. Yeah, we're very excited for it. Yes. Okay. We are very excited because tonight we're going to start with a game. If you'd like to play along, grab a piece of paper, a pencil, and maybe some colored pens if you'd like. That's what we've got. And we're going to be drawing sea monsters. So tag us in your sea monster art and we might send you a prize. Get ready because the first part of today's episode, Amanda has a creature and I have a creature. We've had a third party validate that our creatures are not the same creature. (laughs) We're each going to take turns. She's going to go first, then I'm going to go. And we're going to describe the creature. The other person's going to draw it while we describe it. And then we're going to guess whether it's real or not. And then we'll show each other the photo of what it looks like, as well as (laughs) um, whether it's real or not, obviously. Well, if there's a picture, you'll know if it's real. Or if there's an illustration, you'll figure out that it's not real. (laughs) So if you do draw along with us, we would love if you would tag us in them or send them to us. And 10 out of 10, very excited. I'm terrified because I am no artist and Lindsay is. So it's going to be real bad. (laughs) It's going to be a fun time. I'm excited. Just real quick so you can see. Oh, it's a little ghosty. Is that what I'm looking at? It's a ghost pencil with a ghost eraser. I love it because everything in my house is ghost. I love that. Okay, well, now I have to get a pencil so I can sketch, I guess, sketch and then draw out. So I saw it in a comic originally. Okay. And then I had to look it up to see if it was real or not because I'm obsessed with it. Okay. Okay. So here's my description that I've written for you. They are very ugly on the outside, sort of like a blobfish vibe. But then when they get pissy, they open their giant mouths and show their mouth rainbows and their jagged teeth to each other. 
And then they have what I can best describe as a kissing battle to establish who is scariest slash biggest. Are they looking to see if their rainbows or teeth are bigger? Which one? I think just maybe their mouths would be my guess. Do you know what color they are? So I know what what background color I'm using. (laughs) Sure. But I do want to say the lamest one will back down. Oh, I love that. They're like, "Mm, no beef, my dudes. No beef. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then their mouth rainbows are also used to chat with one another. (laughs) Cool. So think of, you know what a blobfish is, right? Yeah. It looks kind of like a boring man. Yeah. Yeah. With like jowls kind of. Yeah. 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 I got you. So that's what it looks like on the outside. That's the color too? Yeah. Yeah. We're still going to, we're going to make them zazzier. We're going to do hot pink. So it'll open its mouth and it kind of looks like a demogorgon from Stranger Things. Like it has like that big, I don't know, skin around its mouth. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. When it's all mad. And then, yeah, it's like a normal, I don't know, brownish fish color, like boring seafloor color, right? Okay. Okay. Like a blobfish has the jowls, but its jowls when it opens turns into like the demogorgon. Does it have eyes? It does. It does have eyes. Are they big eyes? Yeah, they're fairly big eyes. I'm having so much fun. If what I'm drawing exists, then uh, as my husband says, I'm just going to yeet on out. Yeah, originally, like I said, I saw it in a comic when I was looking for interesting creatures and I typed in real or fake was my search criteria. So... I also surprised myself whether it was real or fake. See, I, I, don't tell me yet. I'm not. But see, that like makes me feel like it's real, right? Does it have white teeth? Are they like a grayish teeth? Yeah, it's white. And they're jagged, you said, right? Yeah. And it has a mouth rainbow. Mouth rainbow. Yep. Mouth rainbow. And does rainbow mean anything else? Or is it a rainbow? It's colorful. Okay. I knew this would take such an intense drawing. I didn't know there was going to be so many colors involved. What I'm drawing kind of looks like a blobfish shark. Okay. Which doesn't feel right. Mine's going to be just like one of those light drawings of a fish, you know, like the the round with like the uh, triangle at the end. I have some like really specific parameters though for it. Oh, it's still going to be that. It's still going to be that. Oh, look, this is, this pen is literally, it's Amanda purple. Oh, that's my hair. It is. Is it not? Yeah, it's Amanda Purple. I just found someone that does art of this comic, and you could buy paintings. Okay. I love that. Would you like to see it? I want to see it. Oh, if you are drawing at home with us, here's a good point to pause, because we're going to reveal what we're doing. Well, first, okay. first, do you believe that this is a real animal or a fake animal? I think that we need more good things at our world, so I'm going to go real. It is. It is real? Oh, I love it. It is. This is partially why I chose it. It's called the sarcastic fringe head. A sarcastic fringe head? That sounds like a bitch with bangs. I love it. Yeah. So here's a couple fun facts about it while you finish up your drawing. Okay. Okay. So they are found in Pacific waters and they're normally between California and Mexico. So I'm kind of excited that they're sort of close by to me. Maybe I'll find one one day. What they do, fun facts, they ambush their enemies. Quote from sciencealert.com. They like to stake out a hidey hole that offers them both protection and a great vantage point from where they will pounce on their prey. This is also my Call of Duty strategy. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. And continuing the quote, once they've reversed parked into their chosen nook. Reverse parked. Yes. Back that thing on up. They'll aggressively charge at anything that comes too near, including divers. So fuck off. Don't get near their hidey hole. And this is what I think you'll appreciate even more. They were described to look like, quote, yupping Muppets. And it's 100% accurate. Yeah. Muppets, bitch. They are kind of small. They are only about 12 inches at the most. And when I said mouth rainbows to communicate, It has been suggested that they communicate with the colorfulness of their mouths, and I find that amazing. I am 10 out of 10 excited for this. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, you and I kind of uh, communicate with our colors of our hair, right? Like everything that we do is defined by that color. Yeah, I mean, look, my personal aesthetic is like very green centric right now. Okay, I'm sending you a picture of this because I know that the Zoom background won't show it. Okay, I am opening it. Okay, so Amanda is now looking at (laughs) what I drew for her. It is beautiful. I love that you have the pens all around it and made it so cute looking. Thanks. I felt like I should, like, create a scene. It's beautiful. It's Instagram ready. 
Okay, here's one of the first photos I found of it. Oh my God, it's stunning. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. This is the prettiest fish I've ever seen in my entire life. It's so stupid. I love it. And also, I think this is another very crucial fact. I'm going to say it, it's very vaginal. It's a very vaginal rainbow fish. <laughs> At first, I was like, oh, this thing's fake because all that I can find is comics or like painted pictures of it so at first i was pretty certain that this thing didn't exist and maybe it was like in a cartoon or you know something yeah and this is my favorite comic of it so far again very vaginal <laughs> i just think demogorgon no it is demogorgon i think anytime we see like a mouth structure open in a not up and down way it feels very demogorgon-esque and here is what it looks like for reals and we'll post all of these obviously it's stunning. It still has a rainbow fucking mouth. I told you, it has also, a rainbow mouth. Those teeth are haunting. And again, I'll say it for the third time. Vaginal. You like it? Oh, absolutely. My drawing is not anywhere close. It's close. It's Guys, it's not close. It's close. Okay. It's cute, but it's not close. Are you ready, Amanda? I am ready. Okay. So this creature, on its head area, it has very large eyes. Okay. Like a frog, like how you think a frog's eyes would be, or like on the sides? On the sides. Its biggest part of it is its like head area, and then it tapers out as it gets to its tail. Okay. So kind of like a, like a tadpole? That kind of thing, yeah. Okay, I keep going to frog, okay. Yeah, you know, water creature. Okay, it doesn't have a nose, but at the tip of its face, it looks like it has a nose. Okay. It has rabbit-like flat buck teeth. It's a chimera. It's black. Okay. And that's the physical description I have for you. Okay, and you said when its head tapers off, does it have like little fins? I feel like I'm drawing like a naked mole rat. Kind of. Kind of has fins. Does it look like a naked mole rat? Not no, but not yes. Okay. How, like, does it have the little side fins? Are they thin? Yes. They kind of look like elephant ears. Okay. And it eats by crushing prey in their mouth. What color is it? You said just all black? Black. And it lives 2,000 meters deep. Okay. Oh, man. This is, this is real bad. It's hard, isn't it? What kind of eyes does it have? Like, are they the typical, like, one little weird fish eye thing? Or does it have a big black round thing in its eye? What does it look like? You know how, like, humans have, like, a hooded eye area, like, where it goes, it's inset, if you will? It has that. Oh. Oh, fuck. Okay. I thought we said bug eyes. It's bug eyeing. All right. I'm just going to give up. But they are bug eyes, too. Bug eyed, but also, like, it exists in a human-like facial structure. Its fins? Does it have, like, any color to its fins? All black. All black. My kind of fish. I want one. Little goth fish. Goth fish. Or whatever it is. I don't think I would call it a fish. Okay. Um, you said elephant ears. I'm going to sure that means fin if you just put some squigglies on it, right? Yeah. And then, so its eyes, you said they're kind of human-like? Like, does it have a b black round thing for its eye or? It doesn't have like a pupil. Okay. It looks. Like a cat eye? It, no, it honestly, it looks just like it's golden. The eye's just golden. A golden eye. Uh-huh. Right. Adds a layer of intenseness. It looks almost iridescent. You know what's weird? It's my pack of markers does not have a yellow. Disrespectful. And the skin almost looks leathery. Oh, well, now you're, add you're adding more. Okay. I don't have the proper gold yellow, but I do have one yellow. I'm trying to blend. Blend his eyes. Gosh, this is terrible. I am not going to color mine in, pretend it's black, because then you won't be able to see really anything on it. If... You don't want to know, and you're still working on your drawing. You should pause. You think it's real? Do I think it's real? I think it's real. Yeah, a goth fish. It has to be a goth fish. It is real. Thank God. It's a type of ghost shark. So there's two different types of chimeras, right? There's chimeras that exist in mythology, which are half human, half animal hybrids. And then there's chimeras, which describes a certain type of fish. They're both spelled the same way. I was hoping I could throw her off with saying chimera and that she was thinking i was going like goth mermaids also if you know me you know i love mermaids we aren't covering mermaids today there's too much so that's gonna be its own episode so i'm sorry i love you and i love mermaids but it's not today okay amanda are you ready to see this i am and then i'll send you a picture all right i'm i'm gonna color it 
I'm going to have to color it in. Okay. Oh, gosh. It's real bad. It's real bad. I'm very excited to see it. <laughs> Look, it's not that wrong. This is, by the way, this, the full name is A Bucktooth Ghost Shark. Okay. Uh, this is what it looks like. Isn't it hideous? It kind of looks like Hoggle from Labyrinth. <laughs> it's very wrong. <laughs> I like how you did the gold in the eyes, though. Do you see what I'm talking about, though, with its eyes are, like, kind of golden? Yeah. And it's leathery skin? Well, there you go. Well, this was a <laughs> fun game. Fun. <laughs> Stop laughing at my beautiful buck to ghost I'm shark. I'm laughing at both of our, like, cartoon versions of fish. <laughs> Again, if you drew these along with us, 10 out of 10, we want to see them. We're going to wait a couple of days before we post our drawings and the pictures of the actual creatures because we want to give you some time to draw them and get back to us. If you can resist the temptation of the Google machine. So one of the biggest reasons that we chose this topic of episode is because the lassophobia is a thing, which is the intense fear of deep bodies of water. From what I understand, this is caused by a number of different reasons, whether it be just not knowing what's in it or the scary creatures that are in it or just the fact that, yeah, it is very, very deep. These are all good reasons. It yeah. could also be that 95% of the ocean has not been explored. Doesn't that blow your mind? You know it does. Why are we exploring other places if we haven't even explored the planet that we're on? Because it's too scary. Damn it. Especially after researching this week, it is too scary. I know. The idea of going to the beach right now is very unattractive. <laughs> I do like the beach. I like when you can see what's under, I guess, like right where you're standing. Do I like going further out? No. I went snorkeling when we were on our honeymoon and I was excited slash afraid because they have a sign and they have like, because, you know, everyone that travels, they speak all different languages and everything, right? So they just have a, a board and it was a green section with that like happy face and it had a bunch of fish. And then it had a red section with, if you see this fish, do not go near it. And all I'm thinking of is if it's coming at me, what do I do? You swim away. I know, but it's probably faster. There's like a current and movement and... It knows the way. Oh, no. That, I mean, that's fair. And what they were saying to avoid was the lionfish, which they look super cool. And a lot of people want to get pictures of them. But I guess they will hurt you. Yeah, no, they are not chill. No, they are not. But what they did is they had us do like an underwater scavenger hunt. And what... Oh, that's cute. It was cool. And if you found one of their hidden treasures, you would be able to turn it in and they'd give you like an underwater disposable camera to take pictures of all the things you found. Oh, I like that. Yeah, it's fun. But also like when they dropped the little weights in the water and they'd have like a string with a prize thing so you knew where it was and you have to dive for it. You're also going very close to a lot of these fish. That's true. That's true. And like coral and stuff. Yeah. Closer than you necessarily want to be. Yeah, it was very frightening. And we'll we'll get to that too. Yeah. Of what we need to <laughs> currently be aware of. Everything. Just be afraid. So we're gonna start with Grindy Low, which <laughs> sounds like Gryla's first cousin. Doesn't it? It is a fictional creature. It comes from English folklore, and they're thought to be in fresh and murky water, and they're known to skitter onto the land if there's people near where they live, and then they'll grab a child. Of course they would. Or an adult, but they prefer child people. Child people. Child people. <laughs> they prefer child people as their personal flavor because they're going to drag them into the water and eat them. Delicious. Uh, they're considered water demons, and they're pale green. What a time. <laughs> I couldn't find like a ton of them, but I was like, that's interesting. And these are not real. Do I think that they exist? Not really. Not that I'm aware of. I don't think that they're real. <laughs> well, some people might think they're real, but not I. I think Gryla's real, so wouldn't fuck with her. <laughs> so next, we're going to talk about a creature that's perhaps real. It's called Luska. And so it's a Caribbean sea monster. It's been described as either a giant octopus, an octopus shark... Ooh. Or a squid-eel hybrid. None of these are sounding good. So, what I said before, though, the demon-scorpion-spider hybrid existed, so why can't this? I mean, you're right. 
So it's thought to have razor sharp teeth, multi suckered tentacles. It can change colors, and then it ranges from seventy five feet to two hundred feet, somewhere in there. That's and then big difference. Yeah, and then some have said that it has multiple heads or dragon like features. So what you're hearing here is a lot of conflicting accounts of what it might look like. In St. Augustine in Florida, a globster washed up onto the beach in 1896. A globster? Yes, a globster. So it's not just a fun word to say, it's an actual term. And it was coined by Ivan Sanderson in 1962. And it's a term used to describe an organic mass that washes up onto the beach when it's kind of unclear what the mass is. In Sanderson's original use of the word, he was describing the Tasmanian carcass, which we're not going to get into that, but it was another mass that washed up onto a shore. And he said it had no visible eyes, no defined head, and no apparent bone structure. It's kind of like just this like organic mass. You don't know what it is. It looks like it was from a living non-plant creature. What is this? Okay, sure. In 1995, the tissue was analyzed and it was decomposing fat tissue from a sperm whale. So, not Luska. <laughs> no, not Luska. <laughs> well, Luska is believed to be in large underwater caves, which we're going to talk about actually in a bit because those do exist. Don't like it. Nope. So they're like on the edge of land. So they're not in the middle of the ocean, but they're closer to land, which a lot of those underwater caves actually are close to land. So that would make sense. Yeah. So its primary food source is other large crustaceans. So it's normally found around them. Luska is sometimes blamed for the disappearance of swimmers and cave divers. And some claim that Luska has taken people off decks of boats or taken entire boats. So perhaps it lives in the Bermuda Triangle. I was thinking that. I was like, what if it's the same? What if? And also, I want to say it was in the Belize cave system mm -hmm. that they do lose a lot of divers quite often. What is the deepest one? So that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe this is why. <laughs> yeah. So in 2005, an underwater photographer said he was attacked by a 50 foot long octopus. He took a photo to protect himself and the creature disappeared into a cave. So I don't know why taking a photo would protect him unless you're playing the game Fatal Frame. I think it's the flash, but <laughs> okay. Well, I've just, that is one of my favorite games. So maybe he likes it too. I don't know what that means. That's, maybe he It's do. a horror game where you take pictures of ghosts to defeat them. Sounds really stupid, but it's highly creepy. Huh. So the photographer was near one of the blue holes and he was swimming around sundown. So also think about that. It's near sundown, right? You're near a blue hole. You're not going to be able to see exactly what's under the water either. So maybe that might be partially why he used that flash. Yeah. He was grabbed and pulled underwater violently. So I think of like a horror movie, like a Jaws. Jaws <laughs> or any of those. Yeah, where they grab them and they shake them around. Okay. So, sounds horrifying. He got away and he found that he had a giant sucker mark where he had been grabbed. Don't like that. No. Mm -mm. A group of divers tried to catch Luska, which, silly. Like, don't, don't try to catch sea monsters. No, let them be. We've all seen these movies on sci-fi. <laughs> don't do it. It's just, we don't need them. Let them live their blue hole lives. But so they were on an expedition and they realized that something was pulling their traps and it felt large and heavy and it was breaking the lines. It pulled the trap line so hard that it pulled the boat at one knot, which is fast considering it was pulling it. Sonar yeah. on the boat reflected a large pyramid-like structure. Weird. Yeah, very, very strange. Then, in January of 2011, remains of a massive octopus were found on the shore of Grand Bahama Island. And the only thing they found was its head and its mouth. So, we know, because there's a head-like structure, this wouldn't be a globster. But based on the size <laughs> of the head and the mouth, they thought it would be 20 to 30 feet long. Which, if Luska is a type of creature... I would think that would then be a baby Luska. A little oh, Luska, a baby if Luska. you will. Little Luska. So it's, it's been on a few different television shows. It's been in River Monsters, Terror in Paradise, where they said it was probably a large octopus. 
in Destination Truth, they dove into a blue hole and found a wall opening. Yeah. And sonar showed that there was something massive in the water with them. And the dive leader, Josh Gates, he saw something very large move. And at first he thought it was the wall because it was that large, but he couldn't get a look at it. Okay. There's also cameras that showed something was nearby. So the team turned off the lights of the boat because they didn't want to attract the creature since it has its reputation for pulling whole boats down. And when the footage was watched, they realized there was a very, very large tentacle. So they thought that it was either a large squid or octopus. That's frightening. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, so there's some reasons why they may exist. Other animals have been seen near blue holes, so it wouldn't be unreasonable that a predator animal would live there too, which makes sense. Food source, right? Yeah. So we will talk a little bit more about blue holes in a second, but just to give you an idea, it's like a an intricate system of underwater caves and they haven't really been explored. So it's not like we would know what was in them if something only lived in them. Yeah, exactly. It reminds me actually that that shark movie that came out last year, they go into a cave system with the weird blind shark. The Meg? No, it was a second movie. It was really bad. Oh. But anyways, so some other theories, and this kind of makes sense. It might just be a big squid or an octopus, which, yeah, yeah. Why wouldn't it be, I guess? Yeah, that's where I would go. I was just like, just a big one of them, you know? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It also could be a natural oceanic phenomenon, which is caused by a quick tidal change. So perhaps it's water being sucked into the blue hole, which causes a whirlpool. And once the current is reversed, the water forces any wreckage back up to the surface. Which would make sense, yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah, that that could be it. I still go with just like a giant octopus or squid. Yeah, that's what makes the most sense to me, especially given that there's so many conflicting descriptions of what it might look like. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, is it a squid, octopus, an octopus eel, a squid shark? I don't know. It's some combination of sea creatures that are big and scary. Yeah. That's kind of what it sounded like to me. But back to what you had said, though, not everything's been explored. I guarantee there's many, many different creatures that we don't know exist yet. And almost every year you hear new fish identified or new bug identified. And you're like, ugh, each one gets more horrible than the last. Yes. So let's talk about blue holes. I didn't know about them before starting the Luska research. I fell into a rabbit hole of blue holes. They're beautiful, but terrifying. Oh, yeah. I I feel like I've seen pictures of them before, but I never really looked at what they were. I just thought it was like a dip in the ocean floor, which I guess it is. Yeah. But I didn't realize there was so much more to it. Yeah. And so basically, in some parts of the ocean, there are complex sets of limestone caves that were once on dry land. And then the ice caps melted, and so then they became submerged in water. When there is a sinkhole in the caves, that's what causes a blue hole. So it's kind of like, in my head, how I see it is like a, like a downward hole, but there's caves all around. So it's kind of like a honeycomb, right? Oh, that's fair. Yeah. So again, they're like this deep, beautiful blue. And the water at the bottom of them is anoxic, which is water that doesn't contain oxygen. And I sent that to Amanda and she was like, how does H2O not have O? (laughs) So (laughs) I was like, what a good question. So per FJ Malero in redox processes in anoxic water, anoxic waters are defined as those waters that have dissolved oxygen. This condition can occur in natural waters when the rate of consumption of oxygen exceeds the supply. So it's basically like more oxygen is taken out of the water than can be replenished. That's how I understood it. And so... What is sad to me is that there's little crabbies and little lobsters and other crustaceans just like living their life on the ocean floor under the sea. And they're like walking and walking and walking and then they'll fall into a blue hole and then they'll die from a lack of oxygen, which I said to Amanda, I was like, it's the equivalent of us falling into the water and not getting oxygen. Like that that could happen to a sea creature. I was like, oh, that's terrible. And also fascinating because that means that there's a place on earth without oxygen. What might that mean? We'll get to that in a moment. When I was saying the cave system movie thing that I was trying to think of, it's 47 meters down uncaged. Oh. And it was awful, but it was like this weird blind shark that lived in the caves underwater. And the movie itself was dumb, but just thinking of being in an underwater cave kind of freaks me out. I don't even like the movie The Descent. That's above water caves. The Descent? 
that fuck you up is one of the scariest movies yeah i was like not okay after that no just the when they're going down into the cave and they're like squishing around down to get into it that hurt my brain I think I might just be boring because there's no part of me that's like, let's go spelunking. I'm like, nah, I'm good. Mm -mm, no. Whatever's in the cave can stay in the cave. It doesn't need me in there mucking around. So let's talk a little bit more about blue holes because they're fascinating and I feel like more people need to know that they exist. So there's a really big one in Belize. There's one in Egypt. There's one called Dean's Blue Hole in the Bahamas. There's a blue hole in Palau and one in Guam. So the Belize one, that's the one that I saw a lot of videos on YouTube and I think, like you mentioned, like Discovery. Mm -hmm. What I thought was interesting, too, is that when blue holes are discovered, they're often discovered by fishermen or by divers. So there could be more blue holes that we just don't know about because people haven't gone near them. Which I would imagine that they would have realized them by satellite images. I guess in my brain, there's a lot more satellite imaging taking place than actually is. <laughs> well, I feel like, like you mentioned before, we're more concerned with looking at other planets and the moon and all of that and not really concerned with what's in the ocean. So they're not probably spending as much money on it. So the Belize Blue Hole, and it's also called the Great Blue Hole, which is hilarious. I don't know why, but it's perfectly circular. It's 984 feet across and 354 feet deep. Terrifying. Damn. It's the largest sea hole in the world. It's about 62 miles offshore from Belize City. And there's also stalactites and stalagmites. Have you ever seen stalactites or stalagmites? Mm-mm. I don't think so. There's caverns here that you can go into that are like tourist attractions. And it's basically like rock structures down, rock structures up. And they're stunning. There's a place called Low Ray Caverns near us that is like the prettiest. And when you come to visit the East Coast... It's a definite must see. Like Ben and I just like, I was like, let's go for a drive. And we ended up going to a cave system near Hershey, Pennsylvania. And like the stalactites and the stalagmites inside were like this beautiful iridescent white that like comes up out of the ground. It looks just so gorgeous, but interesting. All I'm concerned about when I come to visit is to go see with the Blair Witch. We'll be seeing the Blair Witch, stalactites and stalagmites. We'll have to take Ollie to Hershey Park, which is a chocolate theme park. Only if I can leave him with you. No, it'll be a good time. It'll be a good time. <laughs> he can take pictures with a Reese's cup. <laughs> it's a treasure. But so there's also a blue hole off of the Gulf Coast of Florida. This one is a little deeper. It's 425 deep. But interestingly, it glows. Why? I don't know. And I'm pretty sure researchers also don't know. And when I was researching... I saw a quote and I was like, don't like that. Because it was, it literally said, quote, researchers don't know much about blue holes. And I was like, how do you, how do you, what, what why, why are we doing anything else? <laughs> Meanwhile, I saw an article earlier about someone offering to pay a certain number of people to go to the moon. But sure, we don't know anything about blue holes. People were like, we need to get off this planet. We're already killing it. <laughs> Sad and true. But so the blue hole off the Gulf Coast is called the green banana. I don't know why. But they found endangered species. It's a small toothed sawfish. Two of them were found dead intact at the bottom. So there was an expedition there in 2018 and they found plastic bottles at the bottom of the blue hole. That's horrible. Like we can't have nice things. We ruin everything. Don't we? Don't we? We do. Yeah, that, that makes me so sad. Nothing is untouched by plastic. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I said it before. Areas with zero oxygen. What does that make you think of, Amanda? Zero oxygen? Space? Yeah. So there's two different astrobiologists, Jen McCauley and Kevin Hand. I have long quotes from them. Yes? Wait, space. Are you telling me? Blue holes. That's where the aliens live happily then because they're used to space. Yes. They have like very long quotes, but basically this is the gist. This is from Kevin Han because they both seem relatively similar in like what they're saying. It's through our study of life's extreme on Earth that we can extend our understanding of habitable environments off of Earth. And that's from Kevin Han. I don't like that it's ocean and space are the same thing. And also, Jen McCauley, who's also an astrobiologist, said, if we can understand precisely how these microbes are making a living in the blue holes, we know what to look for in oxygen-free worlds. And the idea Ooh. that, like, okay, we want to go see space, 
But if we just did this one damn thing, we would know. We would be able to like be more effective at it. And it's also, it's interesting too that Kevin Han, he's an astrobiologist and NASA's deputy chief scientist for solar system exploration. So like, Ooh. this is a person who does space. Okay. I'm just happy the underwater aliens came back. I mean, under underwater aliens are always coming back. But I mean, just again, the fact that we have this intricate structure of caves on our planet that have not been explored. What the literal fuck? No. No one wants to explore it. Think about it. If I said, Lindsay, I would fund you to go explore a blue hole or space. There's people who do the ocean science. No one wants to do it. No. They're... Yes. Ocean scientists. Yes, there are people that do ocean science. <laughs> that is an actual science. We talk about a lot of different types of science. That's actually a real one. Okay, man. I love how frantic you get when you talk about ocean aliens. She's like flailing around and like grabbing her hair. And I am. They can probably hear me flailing because I'm moving up and back and forth on the mic. I can't even talk. Okay. I'm flustered. Scary subject for her. She's very scared. <laughs> I am. I am. I, I am anxious for lack of a better word. <laughs> Well, to get you a little more anxious then, there are a lot of prehistoric sea monsters. And the reason why we're including these, one, because there's some that people believe might still be out there somewhere. And then two, just the thought that these things existed is pretty haunting. Well, so we only know 5% of the ocean. I am unconvinced that they're not alive. Exactly. Well, they might not be, but things that have come from these things are. Yes. So the first one is a megalodon, and everyone's heard of this before. I've heard of it. I've seen the funny sci-fi things on it. So it is the closest living relative to the great white shark, and that's why I think everyone has this fascination with them. They weighed between about 50 to 75 tons. Their teeth were over seven inches long. And why we know that is they are everywhere. So because sharks shed teeth, they did too. And they've been discovered all over the world. So they just left their shark teeth all over the place. And they were about 55 to 60 feet long. It's the biggest prehistoric shark. It's the largest marine predator in the history of the planet. Why do we need a shark that big? We don't. We don't. We don't. <laughs> That's why they took it away. Maybe. So <laughs> it ate prehistoric whales, dolphins, squid, fish, and giant turtles, which makes me sad. I like them. Crunchy. Cool. It had 10 tons of biting force. 10 tons of force in their bite. Don't like it. I don't like it. Also, interestingly, here's the trick. You're going to tell me a story. I'm going to call back to every episode. It could not bite through the Georgia Guidestones. Nothing can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're idiots okay but anyways so it had the most powerful bite of any creature that has ever lived but still the guidestones are safe from it don't worry Lindsay. i just blinked at her she just said that and i was just like i <laughs> I'm not prepared to, like, be okay with the fact of these creatures, right? Because before it was fictional, right? Everything was all cute because we were talking about Luska. And we were like, perhaps they think they need the water. But this is, like, science. Science has shown these are for realsies. This bitch existed. Yeah. Yep. For realsies, this thing was a thing. I'm not doing great, guys. I'm not doing great. I'm paler than normal. <laughs> just saying something it's very difficult and that's hard i'm like doodling a loaf of bread just to <laughs> feel okay <laughs> loaf of bread you would it's okay delicious. so <laughs> the u.s and australia back in 2008 had a joint research team that used computer simulations to calculate its bite power what i think of is when they use the simulations of elsa to solve dyatlov pass <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're taking simulations of Bruce from Finding Nemo. Disney science. Yes. Disney probably helped with this too. For sure. Ziz. Okay, just qu quick question. What do you think is a scientific priority? Global warming or figuring out how this old ass shark bit? <laughs> <laughs> Can you write them a letter real quick on your typewriter? A strongly worded letter on my typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> because I just, you know, every once in a while you'll see a research study and you're like, that's the priority. Yeah, exactly. 
Dear Joint Research Team in 2008. Can't you stop being ocean scientists and be climate scientists? I understand it's different science, but I digress. I digress. (laughs) They're like, let me change it over. So for comparison, (laughs) we're going to keep talking about this. Great white sharks had 1.8 tons of force per square inch. These guys had 10.8 to 18.2 tons of force. I don't like that. So just a little more, a little more force behind it. Just a touch. Just a touch. So here's the thing. Researchers are not entirely sure why they went extinct. Maybe they didn't. Exactly. I could see them just moving more like central into the central ocean. Into the caves. You know what I mean? Like getting further from the coasts where we would find evidence of them and... Maybe. Well, they're big. So like they need more room. Yeah, they need more space. They need not to have so many boats in their way. Yeah. And I would imagine like if we are fishing, then that means that the fish that would eat the fish that we would eat, there would be less of them. And then the fish that eat them, there would be less of them. And the fish that eat them, there would be less of them. Like 15 tiers down, the Meg doesn't have a big enough food supply, you know, because of us, because we ruin everything. Well, they say perhaps maybe it's the global cooling and maybe the food source diminished when the giant whales did. So because of all of this, some people question if they actually did go extinct or not. And they believe that they might even be out there somewhere. So like we said, they're probably just, they probably moved. They packed up their little fish friends and they moved to the middle of the ocean to get away from everyone. I don't like it. Yeah, I agree. Which sounds fair. I would do the same thing. (laughs) Is it Basilosaurus? I don't know. I just think of Bulbasaur for some reason. Okay. It's Bulbasaur. It says Basilosaurus. If you're British, it's Basilosaurus. <laughs> you see what it did there? It's not funny. It's a Basilosaurus. AKA Bulbasaur. Ben and I watched the Pikachu detective movie over the weekend, and he was calling <laughs> Squirtle Squeedle. <laughs> like, he was like a great value version of it. And then he called Pikachu <laughs> Pikachu. And I was like, you've, you've heard of these before, right? And like, something will come on the screen. And he'd be like, what's that? And I'm like, you cannot be this geriatric to not know any single Pokemon. Did he age like 25 years in the last week that I haven't talked to him? He knew zero Pokemon. Okay, a Basilosaurus. They're one of the first identified prehistoric whales. Basilosaurus is Greek for king lizard, even though this isn't a lizard, it's a whale. And so it's also not a king, not really compared to other whales, because it's not that much bigger than them. Yeah, it's not more intense than another whale. So, <laughs> Yeah, so it's not a king and it's not a lizard. It's a liar. It was very much misidentified, yeah. Do you feel like the basal stars had like imposter syndrome? It was like, I know, like I have a really intense name, but I didn't pick this, guys. Anywho, it had a long body that's kind of eel-like and it was 65 feet from head to tail. That's big. And weighed five to ten tons. Still not as much as Georgia Guidestones, but, you know, can't win everything. Nothing can compare. Yeah. We're just really just... (laughs) We're just roasting this Basilosaurus. But anywho. Okay. (laughs) We should name this episode the Roast of the Basilosaurus. (laughs) Scientists think that it looked and swam like a giant eel. Because it was a giant eel. eel whale. Okay, here's my questions for you. First off, why? My second thing is, why do they call this a whale if it was an eel? You know, like that doesn't make sense to me. It just looked like an eel. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. You said prehistoric things, and I found prehistoric things, and they're hard. I'm not saying I'm not saying them for you to answer. I'm saying this for the world to answer, not you. Okay. It looks like a. I'm pulling it up too. So stupid looking. <laughs> oh no that thing looks stupid <laughs> oh man this thing this poor thing this looks like a <laughs> i saw it last night but it's just this looks like a dolphin snake that a five-year-old drew what's the bottom of its tail is that its penis no it's its fin oh it's second <laughs> fin it looks dumb guys it's like okay i love it i love it all right draw this i want you to imagine a uh a dolphin that's been stretched out and it's got two little dumb flippers in the back. Just two stupid little flippers. Like, think T Rex arm, but back flippers. This has to have been like a step in evolution. This is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. 
Well, I'm also, I'm looking at one where people are just, like, throwing around the term Basilosaurus on the internet, like, it's all the same thing, because I was looking at something that was looked like a walrus with one wonky tooth, and it was not that. But anywho... <laughs> I love it. It's me in prehistoric sea creature form. <laughs> this thing is silly as hell. Somebody, like, was, like, pro Basilosaurus and, like, really wanted to make it look badass. So they drew it as, like, a crocodile fish is kind of what it looks like because it has, like, the triangular head and it's got, like, these fierce little teeth. But, like, they definitely tried to, they were like, let me help you out, Basilosaurus. And was like, I'm gonna make you seem, like, a little more scary. Because I feel like, I'm just gonna say it, the Basilosaurus is a real punchable face. I feel like I could take it. I know it's five to ten tons, but it's... It's got a real punchable face. <laughs> I'm pro Basilosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm not against Basilosaurus. I'm just saying they've got a real punchable face. It sounds like you are. Uh, it's a dolphin whale eel. It's an abomination is what it is. <laughs> it's got creepy little rounded teeth and these beady little eyes and these creepy little stupid back fins. You know what? You're the reason it went extinct because you were too mean Good. to it. Look at the pictures that I sent you, please. First, the artist rendering where it's like I the punk rock version of it where it's like <laughs> Like you can see it, right? Like he's like really intense. Yeah. And then the stupid version where it's an image, but it looks like it's probably like a rendered image because I don't think we have images of these. Anywho. Well, I think it's great. I think it's pretty. Okay. Anywho. We're all like inclusive. All stupid whales. This one had a smaller than usual brain and it may not have been capable of having the same behavioral characteristics of modern whales. <laughs> this is a stupid whale. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming next. <laughs> Woof. The roast of Basilosaurus. I love okay, it. <laughs> this guy, so I did not kill yeah. this because, Amanda, I'm only like a year older yes, than you. Yes, you did. I wasn't around 40 to 34 million years ago. But it wasn't officially named till the 18th century. And some of its fossils were found and used for fireplaces or foundation for posts for homes. Which, that's the most disrespectful thing that I can think of, like... Well, they didn't know what they were. They didn't realize that it was a fossil at the time. I mean, fair. Fair. The Basilosaurus is a state fossil from Mississippi and Alabama. <laughs> they retain their rudimentary elbows, which disappeared in later whales, because why the fuck would a whale need an elbow? Their vertebrae were hollow and filled with fluid, which is different than whales now, because whales now have solid bones. But like... That feels like a real whim whamsy situation, right? It feels like an egg-like bone. They weren't very good structurally, okay? I'm gonna just put it out there. The Basilosaurus was a goddamn lemon. I love it. The lemon of dinosaurs. <laughs> if you have other lemons of dinosaurs, please tell me. But the Basilosaurus is by far the lemon of dinosaur. And just in case you needed another example of that, because of their weird egg-like brittle bones, they had to live closer to the surface of the water because their hollow-ass backbone couldn't take the water pressure. This water creature couldn't handle the water because it's weird brittle bones and it's small brain and it's elbows. <laughs> it's poor brain. <laughs> <laughs> You're so mean to this poor thing. I'm just... I'm pro Basilosaurus. You know, I'm not not pro Basilosaurus. You're real mean to it, though. Do you think that it's the lemon of dinosaurs? Well, I think all dinosaurs were kind of lemons, right? You're right. You're right. Okay. Do you think this is the lemon of sea creatures? You come across a Basilosaurus or a modern day shark in the water. Which one are you more afraid of? Well, for the fear factor, sure, but like, which one do I like more? The Basilosaurus, clearly. It's so stupid that I love it. No, no, no. We're talking fearsome. You're in the water. Which one are you like, oh, fuck, I'm dead? Ugh. Is it standard shark? I mean, clearly it's shark. It's the shark because the Basilosaurus is a lemon of sea creatures. But it's so cute. Look, I'm not saying it's not cute. I'm just saying it's also a <laughs> dumb creature. You did say that. You said it was stupid looking. No, it can be dumb looking and cute. Also, my nephew tells me that saying, hey, dummy, is what you say to your friends now. And that to say you like someone's shoes, you say those shoes are raw. So for example, hey, dummy, your shoes are raw. I don't know. I don't know. I'm old. I've got a side part, you know? Anywho. Let's continue on. We'll never forget you, Basilosaurus. Yes. Just one last thing. The best thing is when you see it compared to other <laughs> whales now, side by side. It doesn't look like a whale. It looks like 
Beautiful. Magnificent, even. It looks like an eel, a crocodile, and a swordfish had a baby. I should have picked this as my creature. You absolutely should have. What are those back fins doing? Nothing. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. Amanda, what is around to ruin oceans for me? And you and everyone else. It's not all about me, I'm aware. But also, what's gonna, what ocean creatures do you have to discuss? <laughs> okay. So this one actually surprised me quite a bit. I had never heard of it before, and I don't know how I didn't because they're so scary. It's a cone snail. Okay, so it sounds not intimidating. It looks like a little snail. It doesn't look scary at all. They're only about 10 to 15 centimeters long. However, one single drop of their venom is enough to kill 20 men. Is cone snail venom traceable through blood test <laughs> <laughs> carry on don't worry about me <laughs> i want the answer <laughs> is it i don't know I'm asking you oh i thought you said i have the answer no i said i want the answer i don't know but the venom from one cone snail could kill 700 people 700 i saw 20 men 700 20 men with one drop but one cone snail's worth a whole cone snail. Oh. Yeah. That's terrifying. So how they do it is, they, I guess they harpoon their prey with their hollow teeth. So what they do with their teeth is they inject their venom through them. Oh, so kind of like a snake. I didn't even know that snails had teeth. Snake snail teeth. Yeah. Yeah. They're snake snails. I didn't either. I'm just saying, we've covered some cases and we've wondered how people died and... I doubt the cone snails are traceable. It looks real weird. It's a weird thing. But anyways, so they are found so, so you can make sure that you're safe. So there's approximately 500 species of them, but the ones in the Indo-Pacific region tend to have the more harmful toxin. Woof. Yeah. Now here's my favorite fun fact about them. Their nickname is the cigarette snail. Is it because they smoke? Yes, they smoke, but also because if you are stung by one, you might have enough time to have a cigarette before you die. Woof. I don't like that, but that's terrifying. Yeah, I don't like it. I didn't know that a snail could kill you. The slowest of predators. <laughs> yeah, like now I, I see snails in a different light. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. And it looks like nothing. Like you would see this. It just looks like a snail. You know, you see a picture of it and you're like, okay, it's a snail. Like, I'd pick it up, you know? And if you pick it up, it will then kill you. Nope. Don't fuck with nature. It will kill you. Don't fuck with nature. And now, like, I don't know, when you think of snail, you think, safe. It's just a stupid little snail. This fucker can kill you. Not okay. Some people aren't going to like this. But when I hear snail, you know what I think? Escargot. Gary? Delicious. Oh. Yes. I love it. No. No. It's delicious. It's like clams. This is not the episode to be talking about seafood. Anywho, let me tell you about flower urchins. <laughs> so of all the urchins, they're the most frequently encountered, but they're also the most venomous sea urchin. Isn't that disrespectful? I love it. Oh, no. So that's not okay. As always, we'll post pictures. This is a very picture heavy episode. So we'll definitely share some photos from what we're talking about. But so the urchin's gorgeous and it has these flower like tentacles that to me almost kind of look like little white calories. A lot, a lot of them. But yeah. Yeah, like dozens and dozens of them. If that part touches you, the urchin will then pump venom into your body. And that venom will cause spasms, convulsion, paralysis, shock, and death. But like also, if you're spasming, convulsing, and or are paralyzed in water, you will drown. Which I think is part of the like the terrifying part of some of these creatures is that what they cause on land wouldn't be great. But when this occurs in water... <laughs> You're fucked. I don't like it. I don't like it. And when you look at it, it's it's like the classic when you're looking at like the coral reef, right? Or I don't know where it actually is, but it's like what the urchin looks like in your mind. Yeah. And it's it's a murder plant thing. Yeah. It is absolutely a murder plant. A murder urchin. One might say it's a merchant. I'm looking at a picture of someone who got stung and it, their hand is like white. And then there's like these little black marks in it from where the venom wasn't like injected. Yeah. Not okay. Oof. Okay, so next we're going to talk about stonefish. So they're the most venomous fish in the world, and they carry the venom in their fins. 
sense. And also disrespectfully, they're very good at camouflaging into their surroundings and they're only 30 to 40 centimeters long. Amanda, I have a fact you're going to love. I don't think I'm going to love it. They're a member of the scorpion fish family. Oh, of course they are. And because we needed a scorpion fish family, that had to be a thing that existed. So the venom is extremely painful and it can cause temporary paralysis, heart failure, seizures, low blood pressure, difficulty breathing, nausea, and abdominal pain, all of which are very bad. But then you put it into you are in water, which means it would also cause drowning, right? But it can kill a person in less than an hour too, the, the venom itself. I don't like it. Typically, they'll use their venom as for defense, but they'll also use it when they want to kill something to eat. Cool. And they like to sit on the seafloor around coral and rocky reefs, and some even have algae growing on them. So they don't even like look like fish when you're looking at them right away. It take, takes a second to understand what they are. Ugh. Don't like it. They blend in. No. Not a fan of any of these. No. Now, and this makes me not want to go near the ocean anymore. So if you're planning an ocean getaway. Yeah. When the world stops ending, don't listen to this anymore because it's just going to hurt. I think it's too late for them. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's too late for them. So we have two left and they're both jellyfish. The first one is an irikonji. The sting can cause fatal brain hemorrhages. It's only three centimeters long, but their tentacles can be a hundred centimeters. Don't like it. It's, it's creepy that it's so tiny, but so lethal. Don't like it. Yeah. Hannah Mitchell, who survived a sting, which is sad that you have to say they survived. I could feel my lungs and my heart. Everything inside me felt like it was crumbling. I know. And she was like, just let me die. I was like, oh God, that's so sad. Fair. Yeah. That sounds awful. Just jellyfish in general. Like they're, they're very, very pretty, but in no way do I ever want to be near one. I don't understand their purpose. Yeah. <laughs> what is their purpose? Why do jellyfish exist? I'm just coming for sea creatures today. You are. You have something against them. Oh, their food. That's why. Thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> You're welcome. And a lot of the pictures that I see of them, they're in like little vials too. So they're tiny, tiny. You know, you can't see it. It's just going to be there and it's going to kill you. Yep. So it has four tentacles. They look clear too. Yeah. So there's a guy that's holding a jar of them. They're in like a glass jar. And I only can see one because his hand is covering it just so where you can see the outline. So can you imagine being in water? I would never see that. And a bunch of these things? No, there's no way. I am a very big proponent of like, if you go into something's natural habitat, don't be offended that you're in its natural habitat. Yeah. However, how do you know if you can't even see it? We have one more thing to talk to you about. As a reminder, stick around at the end and we're going to talk to you about Patreon stuff. So, tell us about box jellyfish. This is probably the most widely known scary creature in the ocean, I think. I feel like I've heard box jellyfish are no good several, several times. So, they're the most dangerous sea creature. Which is silly. Start. And it's no shark. It's no giant whale that wants to eat you. It's just stupid jellyfish. And it's the most dangerous. There are about 50 species of box jellyfish. But only a few can kill a human, luckily. They're found in warm coastal waters. And the most lethal varieties are found in the Indo-Pacific region and northern Australia. <laughs> or Australia. They've caused more human deaths in Australia than snakes, sharks, and saltwater crocodiles combined. Wow. Notice they didn't say spiders. Ugh. No, oh, I can't even say the word. Ha ha! Your face fell! Ha ha! Not just me! I hate them. I hate them. And there's no, like, they're not even that horrible. It's just the thought of them. Don't like it. Fair. So they're transparent and like pale blue in color. So that's what makes them almost invisible as well. So you don't really know that it's coming. I don't like that. One jellyfish contains enough venom to kill 60 people, which that cone snail still yeah. beats that. It can cause paralysis cardiac arrest and also if stung one can die in less than five minutes they don't just float so other jellyfish tend to just kind of go with the the water right yeah these guys actually swim so i feel like they will go out of their way to kill you i don't like that though i know that's probably not true but they could swim and that's what it leads me to believe i mean fair no no one likes that 
So they also have the ability to see and they have eyes on all sides of their body. <laughs> all sides of their body. Yeah, each side of their body. Don't like it. I don't like it. They have eyes. So they're just, no matter what way they turn, they can see you so they can find you and they can hunt you. And the reason I say hunt is because researchers believe that they can hunt because they can swim and see while others can't. I just feel like they want to kill everyone. I don't like it. So they're responsible for 79 deaths since the late 1800s, which again, doesn't seem like a ton. Yeah. But also just because people have survived doesn't mean that they're not that bad, right? Like it just sounds horrific and they're invisible. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Nope. So that, that concludes the creatures that are still alive that want to kill you. There's a bunch of different ones. So the reason why I chose a couple of these is because they seem so innocent. Yeah. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to stick around, we're going to talk a little bit more about our Patreon. The tiers are a lot of fun and they start at only a dollar. So if you want to support the show, head on over to our Patreon link. It'll be on our website. And our first tier is only a dollar and it's called the Mittens tier. <laughs> so if you've listened to all of our episodes, you'll probably be familiar with what we named our tiers. And Mittens includes access to the Bat Bonfire, which is our Patreon-only Facebook group. We're super excited about that. Yes! We've been looking forward to doing this for a little while now. Yeah, and we can actually, you know, connect with you guys. We can talk about the episodes. We can talk about cases that you're interested in. All kinds of stuff. Yeah. Our second tier is my personal favorite because <laughs> it was the name that I gave it, <laughs> The Dump Ghost. So <laughs> what it includes is access to the Bat Bonfire, and then you also get a sticker when you join. So we tend to send everything out at the end of the month that you join. And it's a special sticker that you only get if you're a dump ghost or in a higher tier. And then another cool thing is you also get a sticker every year on your Patreon anniversary. Yeah. And it's not going to be like, oh, you get a true creep sticker every year. It'll be a sticker that's kind of like show related. And this one we designed with show in mind. It's our design. So I think that's really fun that you can only get these in one place. I love it. Our next tier is Fire Yeti, $8 a month, and you get access to the Bat Bonfire, that sick sticker, that sick anniversary sticker, and you'll get a custom annual fall card so long as you join by September 15th so we can get them out in time to you. Yeah. But it's going to be based on like the full year's worth of episodes, and we're super pumped about that. So we already have ideas. So many ideas. And the idea is like, we kind of look a little piece of True Creeps art that you could hold and treasure forever. And- Last but not least is my favorite tier, the Vortex Bouncer. And for $25 a month, you get everything we said before, Bat Bonfire access, sticker, anniversary sticker, that sick card. And you get a t-shirt when you join and as well as a t-shirt every year on your Patreon anniversary month. So obviously different t-shirts, but the t-shirt design that we have is just chef's kiss, chef's kiss. Very excited. The only way to get this t-shirt design is to get it as a Patreon perk, if you will. Oh, and for current patrons, we'll post what everything looks like so you'll get to see it first. Yeah. So if you want to support the show, again, our link will be on all of our social media. It'll be on our website, truecreeps.com. We'd love to have you in our bat bonfire and we can't wait to chat with everyone. So with that, thank you guys for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you for the reviews. And again, if you do a review, screenshot it, send us your address. We'll get you a sticker sent out. If you have any other feedback for us too, email us. We'd love to hear it and maybe get some show ideas too. If you have something that you're very passionate about, our email address is truecreepspod at gmail.com. And we'll see you next week. It's a cone snail. Thanks for listening. For more information on our sources, please visit our website, truecreeps.com. If you'd like to follow us on social media, you can follow us on Instagram at truecreepspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash truecreepspod, and on Twitter at truecreeps. We'd love for you to keep creeping with us. So if you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, review, and share the show with your fellow creeps. <laughs>